So, what are we doing next, Dutch? We just need money. One more decent take. The March Madness winds of change swirl in full swing, or rather sting. Teams pull off massive upsets while fans and fools who pick the Buckeyes pull out their hair. Finishing early from Oral Roberts must have been tough to swallow. Wait, what? While we hold punches and punchlines, a different kind of madness evades the attacks it should be knocked out from. Money madness. Can you believe the NCAA brings in $1 billion yearly, yet the NCAA doesn't pay its main contributors one penny? Or currently, even allow them to profit off their likeness. We can't believe it either. Mr. Krabs' dream is player's nightmare, and this video breaks down just how crusty the reality of the NCAA's economics is. If you don't like that, Business Hub stands with you. We unite by liking this video. Maybe you're one of the dissenting opinion that exposure and a free college education serves as ample compensation. Don't worry, we won't ignore your side and you can show your disapproval by hitting the dislike button. We welcome you to subscribe to our channel for more informative business content either way. As anyone who has taken marketing research knows, the first step to finding a solution to a problem is defining the problem. What is the NCAA? Those four letters stand for National Collegiate Athletic Association. Back when you had to walk uphill a mile in the snow to go to school, and way before today's rules created more yellow laundry hitting the ground during football games and retirement centres, football was pretty barbaric, maybe even worse. It used to be played without helmets or forward passes. That style created the flying wedge. That defensive formation saw players locking arms and using their heads as a concussion-carrying plough in a V formation. Sounds like a Spartan version of Red Rover, doesn't it? Well, 1904 sent 18 players over to the cemetery and 159 to the hospital. Most of the victims were college athletes. Teddy Roosevelt became as scared as you might be listening to this. He had a freshman son playing for Harvard. When the most badass president who commanded a regiment in the Spanish-American War and finished a speech moments after being shot talks with concern in his voice, people listen. As such, he urged the game to be cleaned up on the college level. The Intercollegiate Athletic Association was born. Five years later, it was renamed the NCAA. All grown up, the NCAA now is an organization of 1,098 colleges and universities that divide into 102 athletic conferences. Three divisions classified by school size separate the competitive scale and skill level. The cream rises to the top. Division 1 hosts that cream of the crop with 350 schools. Division 2 holds 310 and Division 3 is the smallest, with the biggest amount at 438. For those who know more about sporting clothes and sports games, look at collegiate games like video games or the Olympic games. Division 3 is bronze tier 3, Division 2 is silver tier 2, and Division 1 is tier 1, the gold medal, hard mode, however you want to view it. Like beating challenging bosses, defeating the top competition reaps the top rewards. Hysterical hype happens in Division 1, where March Madness and all major championships are decided and the spotlight shines the brightest through televised promotion top prospect focus for who will go from holding the pencil in class to the keys of pro franchises, etc. Extravagance derives from extravaganza and the NCAA provides both. Nearly half a million college athletes make up the 19,886 teams that send more than 57,661 participants to compete each year in the NCAA's 90 championships in 24 sports. You don't need an accounting degree to accurately imagine that all these efforts lead to the NCAA generating a ton of revenue. It does. Where does this revenue come from? Nearly half a million college athletes make up those teams. In 2006, the NCAA Division I Football Subdivision Schools, FBS, the highest level of competition in college football, earned $4.4 billion in revenue. Over the next decade, these revenues grew to a current estimate of $8.5 billion. To put that number into perspective, the current one-year revenues of the NCAA FBS alone are estimated to be worth more than the entire Sesame Street franchise. 
No wonder dismissing student-athlete compensation turned so many otherwise happy people into Oscar the Grouch. The total athletics revenue reported among all NCAA athletics departments in 2019 was $18.9 billion. If the 2019 NCAA athletic departments were a media franchise, it would be one of the 25 highest grossing of all time. Let's follow that endless money trail. The crunching sounds of the football field and dribbling of the basketball are what keeps NCAA accountants crunching big numbers and college sports balling financially. Almost 60% of the total athletic department revenue comes directly from football and men's basketball. All other sports directly account for only about 50% of total revenue. The remaining 27% of athletic department revenue comes from other sources, such as the sale of media rights. Most of the value stems from the ability to broadcast football and men's basketball programs. How that works is the NCAA sells content to distributors, both digital and televised. Contracts range from one year to a decade to lock in a long-lasting relationship to secure the increasingly important need for guaranteed content in the age of streaming and consistently huge ratings that are getting cut from cord cutting. Sports enjoy the additional advantage of being live, known in the industry as requiring appointment time, meaning if you missed it in real time, you pretty much missed the enjoyment of the experience, unlike regular shows that can be binged or watched later. Millions honor that time-sensitive commitment. 8.5 million views of the second round of the NCAA tournament on television to be exact. The NCAA revels further in revenue from fans who keep their eyes glued from the stands rather than screens. In 2019, the last year before COVID-19, 19 schools reported at least $20 million in ticket revenue from football alone. In addition to ticket sales, the individual school endorsement deals with apparel manufacturers such as Nike, Adidas and Under Armour can be quite valuable, with the top teams receiving several million dollars per year in both cash and merchandise. For example, the contract for Auburn University carries an estimated value of $3.61 million in cash and $2.25 million in products per year. From public data for Power 5 schools, five athletic conferences representing the elite of the elite in college football, ticket sales and donations account for roughly 40% of total revenue across all schools in 2018, with corporate sponsorships, advertising and licensing around 10%. The numbers and stories behind them establish that the NCAA bakes quite a profitable pie. Student athletes perform in the same kitchen, so why can't they get a slice? The official answer is amateurism. The NCAA Division I manual states, they, student athletes, should be motivated primarily by education and not by the physical, mental and social benefits to be derived. The NCAA thinks education should be all students' motive. However, between the lines probably drawn by millionaires with overly expensive pens, profit remains the NCAA's motive. Where there is a will not to pay, there is a contrived way to get away with it. A 2015 study of 409 Pac-12 student athletes regarding time demands revealed that between travel, studying tape, treatments and workouts, Pac-12 athletes spend 50 hours a week on athletics during the season. That eliminates free time which is the top complaint of two in every three surveyed athletes. Academic difficulty is a close second, with students concerned that they miss too much class for competitions and late running practices. The old rule of thumb for academic success is spending three hours studying a week per credit hour. That's impossible for most student athletes unless the NCAA builds robots, which would be cool. Being human forms a frequent dependency on tutors and under the table deals to accomplish graduating with a degree. That sounds like a perk, but considering how much that setup robs students of the foundational knowledge over 98% of students who don't go pro will need in the real world, it isn't. Let's re-emphasize, Pac-12 students spend 50 hours a week on athletics during the season for a billion dollar juggernaut that uses their likeness without paying a penny. Meanwhile, that host expects these athletes to think student first and be content. The oldest argument justifying why is that a young person, 18 to 22, makes enough mistakes dealing with the growing pains of growing up. Even college attendees who are full-time students with no job 
get into the same problems affluent students do, whether it's drinking problems, academic struggles, relationship issues, and other consequences of youthful ignorance. Detractors reason that turning students into employees that, in top cases, may earn more than most graduates, exacerbates the issues. See the ESPN 30 for 30 documentary Broke for more details. If you want to save a well-spent hour, in the words of Biggie, more money, more problems. This argument sounds good in rap music, but lacks quantifiable reasoning and can be easily countered by stating the fact that a young adult is still an adult free to make money and mistakes almost anywhere else. For example, any actress who appears on the Disney Channel, whether 15 or 55, earns a paycheck for their work that's ideally relative to value creation. They are then free to either advance their career wisely or wreck their lives through drug use and other bad decisions, access and affluence buys see Demi Lovato or Britney Spears. Other toxic arguments against student compensation include a doomsday prophecy that, if student athletes are compensated, they'll lead to a hellish scenario where boosters will cause a war over ensuring the students they are tied to get more, or the rich booster will pull funding and all programs except basketball and football will be cut without any other way to fund player earnings. This is a key example of the slippery slope fallacy. Slide on the slope. The popular argument Double D would make is that college athletes receive adequate compensation in the form of scholarships, stipends, and covered expenses. There's no denying a full ride scholarship receives a massive burden most students undertake. Approximately 86% of students receive some form of financial aid, with two thirds applying through FAFSA, F -A -F -S -A. The average loan total for students seeking a bachelor's degree at public institutions amounts to $28,600. The average total loan amount for bachelor's degree seekers at private for profit schools is $33,900. For students at for-profit schools, the average total is $43,900. However, most student athletes don't receive a full ride scholarship. 1% do. For comparison, CBS reports that as of 2011, 0.3% of all university students completely cover expenses through scholarships and grants. The shockingly low numbers permeate the whole landscape. De Niro detractors focus on the staggering amount of yearly scholarship money D1 and D2 schools offer, which totals more than $3 billion. According to NCAA data reported by US News & World Reports, the average athletic scholarship is about $18,000 per Division I student athlete. Keep in mind, these numbers as discussed are incredibly skewed towards schools with elite programs. What De Niro detractors also don't know is less than 2% of high school athletes are offered athletic scholarships. The only sports offering full rides are D1 basketball and certain football teams. For women's sports, D1 basketball, volleyball, tennis and gymnastics. Remember, the NCAA features 24 sports. Undeniable truth exists in the fact that NCAA's platform allows high visibility and the top-notch facilities create special development opportunities for student athletes, allowing the finest to go on to the highest level. Again, less than 2% do. Also, consider the NCAA forces students to stay a year in some sports. Others, such as basketball, render the NCAA's reach outdated. A growing number of top prospects, such as Lonzo Ball, elect to play in a foreign country, or to the NBA's G League out of high school. In the latter league, players earn an average of $35,000 for a year in 2020. Plus, the league provides free housing. This video presents a dark situation. The Golden Coast shines some light at the end of the tightwad tunnel. The California Fair Pay to Play Act kicks into effect in 2023. It allows any athlete in California to make money off their name, image, and likeness, i.e. autographs, endorsement deals, commercials, tutoring, or even YouTube monetization. No, the NCAA doesn't even allow that for athletes. By the way, these are all opportunities colleges afford any other student. California carries a lot of weight, literally and figuratively, in the US, so this is no small step for mankind that takes giant leaps on the court or field in the name of amateur sports. This video beats the NCAA's business model pretty badly. We aren't the first. South Park equated NCAA ownership to slavery. Hello there! 
The name is Eric P. Cartman. I'm a well-respected owner in the slave trade. Like yourself, I'm also in the slave trade. <sighs> you have some mighty strong-looking workers here, sir. I'd be willing to offer you $40 for two of the white ones and 50 for the blacks. Dude in athletes. Oh, that is brilliant, sir. For the record, that's a very far place to go we don't want to touch. But getting dunked on by Trey Parker and Matt Stone isn't a good look for college basketball or any head of the NCAA empire. Even though South Park weighed in, the only laughing matter is the NCAA laughing to the bank at its main labor's expense. Feel free to laugh at us in the comment section with a rebuttal and a dislike click or smile in agreement with a nice emoji. If you're interested in more business than that of college sports, consider subscribing to our channel.